Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at this old piece of junk, um, which it is literally junk, because the way I ended up with this card is, uh, I, one of my friends was basically, like, he's cleaning up, and he's also, he also has a hardware hoarding habit, it's, it's just a general condition of many overclockers is to just hoard random hardware. Um, and yeah, so he had this thing lying around, and it's not working, and so he basically was like, yo, Buildzoid, you want this? And I'm like, I mean, it's a free GPU, and it's a, it's a non-reference free GPU, so that immediately makes it far more interesting than if it was a reference card, just because it's not reference. And non-reference cards are, well, interesting as far as I'm concerned, because, uh, you, you get to see some creative, creativity in the designs. Uh, with them. So this this has a rather interesting heatsink. It has a rather interesting PCB. Let's just get right into it. So uh, it's an HD4890 um, and initially it just looks like a pretty standard dual fan card. Um, but what's so weird about, and I guess we'll just stay on the front of the card for now, what's so weird about the heatsink here is that. And I don't mean the power connectors over there, that's normal for like servers and all kinds of things, but this right here. So normally on modern GPUs you have fin stacks that, you know, are connected to your heat pipe. Now, technically these are fins, but this is not a fin stack, this is an aluminum plate. Now I don't think it's an extrusion, I think it's a, um, what do you call it? I have for completely, like, the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, I, I don't know too much about metal working, so I, I don't know. I, I, I've forgotten the term, but I don't think it's an extrusion because the geometry of this is a little bit too complex for that, because you'll notice that you only really get those, like, really tall fins at the end of that plate, which is just, like, like, that is super weird as far as I'm concerned, right? Like, you, you only, like, there's really not that much surface area, like, relative to how much aluminum this has. Um, so that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, then also you'll notice that plate actually also, like, well, there seems to be, actually, that's probably a, or, you know, I have no idea. They might have just, like, like, inserted the heat pipe, like, inserted it onto the heat pipes now that I think about it. I'm really, con no, it has to be two pieces. Anyway, there's, there's another, like, aluminum plate down there for, for cooling the VRM. Um, now obviously the problem with having an aluminum plate like this is like, well, no air is going to get through that, right? So the solution that Asus came up with for that is that they have this fin stack right here is just completely blocked off, right? Like this is blocked off, which I, like, honestly, I think it completely just disables all of the, let's see if I can get it on camera, like all of this open fin stack over here, like that's blocked off on this side. So it's like, I'm pretty sure most of the surface area over there is kind of useless. Um, also, these fins are just like, this is really shallow. Like, I don't know if you can tell from the camera, but like the depth of those fins is really, really shallow. Also, they're going this way. So the card is like, kind of a, like, like it kind of exhausts out the rear a lot, right? Like you can see. And then of course, most of the rear exhaust is actually blocked off by the rear IO bracket because of course it is. So the card will also leak air into the case right here and there. Uh, then we've got like this passive cooling thing going on over here uh, for the memory, as well as the core, because this is all just one massive aluminum plate over here as well. Um, and anyway, so back to the plate over here for the core cooling. So in order to get air under that, right, there's just a gap between this plate, and then you have that walled off part of the fin. So basically the air that this fan is pushing downwards, like some of it is gonna just splash off of that and, and under the, the card. It's also gonna leak air in this area because this, this isn't fully sealed off, but that's, that's fine. And the same goes down here, like it's gonna leak air over here because you're gonna have high pressure zone right under like the fan down there. Um, interestingly enough, like the, the close, like the sealed up fins aren't like sealed all the way down. Like there's a tiny, yeah, you can kind of see it. Um, actually let's grab this like, and yeah, you can kind of see that there's like a really small opening right at the bottom of like the closed off fins down there. And well, I mean, you can't see it now cause I'm covering it with my fingers. This is really awkward, but yeah, so like. I guess some of the air escapes through that. Like, you need a lot of air pressure to do that, but the thing is, it's a 4890, and most of, like, the, the, these cards really didn't pull that much power. They didn't really produce that much heat. Like, 
or at least as far as I, I, I as as much as I can understand it. There's not really like a lot of great information on on these cards when I checked. Um, GPU test methodology has really progressed, in my opinion, for things like power draw um, and well. Mostly just power draw, because the thing is, like, temperatures, there's not really that, like, temperature and noise, you know, that's that's obvious things that people care about, but but power consumption, it used to be standard that you just measured the whole system power draw, and it's just like, well, that doesn't actually tell us how much heat the heatsink has to deal with, right? Which is the part I'm interested in, because this looks like a really inefficient heatsink to me, right? Like, compared to modern heatsinks, this is like, so we, we've got not a fin stack over there, and a fin stack, but like wrong in every way. And I don't mean the fact that it's going this way. That the horizontal arrangement is actually relatively fine. Um, you see it on a lot of uh, like Sapphire like, likes doing it. Basically, like that that can work. You can you can work with this horizontal fin stack arrangement. That's completely fine. Uh, what's not fine is the fact that these fins are just very shallow. They're blocked off right here, which the uh, the other reasoning for why that's blocked off over there is probably so that they don't get, like, air from this fan, like, colliding with the air from this fan. Also, that's just red Sharpie. I that was scribbling on something. I just realized on camera it looks like I, I might... Well, it kind of looks like I'm cut, but no, that's just red Sharpie ink. And, yeah, it doesn't rub off right now. Whatever. So... Anyway, kind of an interesting heatsink. Then, on the back of the card, uh, we've got some fun things going on. So, uh, we've obviously got a memory heatsink, which, like, the card's two slots thick. Not really, because of the, the memory heatsink, so that's surprising. Also, it's double-sided memory, and the card only has one gig of VRAM, which is... Is it one gig? I'm pretty sure it's one gig. Yeah, it's one gig. So, it's got one gig of GDDR5, and yet it still needs to be double-sided for the memory, because... Yeah, back then, getting really high-density memory chips was not really a thing. Um, so that's kind of like, okay, that's that's kind of interesting. Then also the fact that, like, the heat sun... Like, you don't see that... Like, double-sided GPUs aren't really that rare. Like, you can get double-sided uh, 680s, 770s, Titan... The GTX Titans were double-sided. Actually, a lot of the Titan. I think... And no, the Pascal Titan was not double-sided, because that was a 12-gig Titan, which in my opinion was really stupid, but whatever. Um, yeah, but most of the Titans, like the, the original Kepler Titan, that was double-sided. Then you had the Maxwell Titan, that's double-sided, isn't it? Yeah, it, I'm pretty sure it's double-sided. And then you get like the Turing Titan, that's double-sided. There's also the Titan V, which isn't double-sided for the memory. And also I should, like... Well, uh, calling it double-sided is fine because technically you have memory chips on both sides of the of the PCB, but it does not work like having double-sided memory sticks because the way memory sticks have a, uh, handle having multiple memory chips attached to one memory channel is that they put them in separate ranks and then you can you know get a little bit of a performance uplift if the memory controller is smart enough to take advantage of that. GDDR memory systems don't do that because GDDR memory systems are all about getting the memory clocked really high and one of the, like, the DDR approach of having multiple memory ranks leads to clock regression. Like, you can't maintain as high clock speeds with a very large, uh, very high number of ranks. And so what they do for GDDR, for GDDR systems is they have clamshell mode where basically instead of each memory chip connecting to the GPU core through a 32-bit wide connection, each memory chip connects over a 16-bit connection. So you have twice that, like you can double the density, but you don't get any change, like you don't get any benefit in terms of performance because the uh, memory access is still, like e each memory chip is being accessed at like half the width. So you can't like interleave access or anything because you're, nothing's really changed. Just the, the amount of memory that's available at the end of the connection is different. So anyway, but yeah, the, the heatsink's kind of interesting. So I wonder if the memory runs kind of hot. I don't think the reference cards came with this. Other than that, um, the card also has this right here, which is like, a predecessor to the Pro Adalizer. It's a type of uh, aluminum. Actually, I'm not sure if it's aluminum, but it is a type of polymer capacitor. Um, and uh, Asus claims that this card has like significantly better voltage regulation than re reference uh, 4890s. I kind of wish I could test that. I don't like. I don't really doubt it, but I would like. I kind of doubt that it's entirely because of what they did right here. Because well, when we take the heatsink off. Um, we, we have uh, quite the output filter on the VRM. 
So let's actually start taking it apart because this is basically all I wanted to talk about on the card like so far. Like we've got the the fancy Pro Adlizer predecessor. Um, then we've got you know the funky heatsink with the memory cooling and everything. Um, so that alone is like you don't like you don't really see that on modern cards very much. Even though like you regularly get the double sided memory chips, I guess GD modern GDDR5 is just way more efficient or. Asus just really wanted to go overkill on the on the GDDR5 cooling on this card back then. Um, either is possible. Like, yeah. So, anyway, that's the heatsink off. I don't have the fans plugged in because I didn't want to deal with that. And actually, now that we have the heatsink off, um, yeah, this is another interesting thing. Uh, the heat pipes, right? And also, yeah, like, you just have this massive block of aluminum. So, like, you can see how much of that fin stack is actually just chewed out by the fan. So, yeah, the fins really aren't that deep. And then you'll notice that the way the heat pipes are set up is really basic. And the thing is, like, a lot of the manufacturing cost involved with heat pipes, as far as I'm aware, uh, comes with bending them. So you really don't want to, like, if you want to make a cost-effective cooling system, you ideally don't want to bend the heat pipes, like, as like as much as possible because um that gets uh like the thing is there's always the risk of like cracking them and i'm not sure if there's like a, a like a difficulty with doing it reliably it probably like they've probably figured it out but anyway um yeah back then like you wouldn't really get heat pi like heat pipes very frequently and so um and you'd also not get them this long and so it's kind of interesting that like um you know asus went ahead and just like instead of having what you'd see on like a more modern card where all the heat pipes try to get as close to the core as possible they just have this really thick uh copper plate and then the heat pipes are spread out over that so yeah i'm not really sure how efficient that is like copper is really thermally conductive um so a lot of people sort of like a lot like I, I think a lot of people might underestimate how might overestimate how big the temperature difference between like this heat pipe out here and the more inner heat pipes would be. But yeah, like this this is probably not optimal for you know making full use of the heat pipes. Though at the same time, with how they've designed this heat sink, like like the thing is the heat pipes don't even really go into the fin stack ever. Like they're like the heat pipes are here to spread heat through the aluminum plate. Which is just like, I mean, yeah, that, that makes sense because uh, like heat pipes are like an order of magnitude more thermally conductive than aluminum is. But it's just like, like compared to modern heat sinks, this is weird. Right? Like you'd run the heat pipes into the fin stack so that it's transferring directly to the fins instead of like an aluminum base plate. And that base plate, like, yeah, the, the, like weird heat sink, weird heat sink. Um, Anyway, oh, also the memory chip cooler, like, that's not a solid plate over there. It's got, like, mini fins, which I can't, like, I don't think those actually do anything. Like, there's no way there's actual, like, airflow going, like, prop any amount of airflow going through that. There there's just no way. Like, there's not even, like, any dust buildup over there. So I'm going to say that doesn't even do anything. That should have just been a solid aluminum plate or something. Um, and I'm assuming that's just epoxyed on. Because I, yeah, that's probably, like, so this is probably just epoxyed on. So, weird, yeah, really weird heatsink. Um, also, that thermal pad doesn't fully cover the memory chips. You can only see, like, you can see the imprints, right? It's not fully covered. That's really sticky thermal pad, though. Anyway, um, at least it's not super oily. Like, there are some GPUs where they use thermal pads where it's like, the, like, it, like, they leak a ton of oil. Anyway. So here's the PCB, and, and this is what I meant when, when I was like, yeah, I don't think this cap right here is really responsible for the improvement in voltage regulation that Asus claims this card has. Like, yeah, it'll definitely have some effect, but um, that's an all SMD aluminum polymer. I'm assuming these are aluminum polymers. It's kind of funny because, um, or it's kind of like, like, it's hard to tell because uh, a lot of SMD capacitors are also like... The, the thing is, is like Panasonic um, makes polymer, tan like tantalum polymer caps and an aluminum polymer caps, both in this packaging. And admittedly, they have very different markings, but I'm not sure how long, far back that applies. Also, these might not be Panasonic's. They might be some other manufacturer. They're not Kemet, though, because Kemet, or actually, I don't know, maybe back in the day. Now, these look very much like modern Panasonic's, though. So I don't know. Like, th this is the thing. They could be tantalums. They don't have to be tantalums because 
you can do aluminum polymers in this package. That's that's also completely normal. Um, anyway, these are 470 microfarad SMD capacitors. So these are pretty good. Even like even if they're tantalums or or poly, like it doesn't matter if they're tantalum or aluminum. Like um, th they're still going to have the lower ES uh, ESL and the lower ESR compared to your uh, CAN type capacitors. Because technically speaking, these are SMD as well, right? Like these are these are CANs, and normally you see them in a through-hole package, but now nah, these these are SMD. Uh, we've also got a bunch of input uh, protection fuses, which basically like that doesn't really save you from the card, it, like something on the card dying. What it does help with is preventing further damage when something does die. But uh, the PCB on this is fine. As far as I'm aware, what's wrong with this card is that it's like artifacting. So I guess. Uh, I guess I'll run it over the toaster and, you know, if I'm lucky, it'll start working. If I'm unlucky, the this cap will burst and my room will smell like burst capacitor for ages. Actually, that, that cap is going to so burst. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, getting caps too hot, like... Eh. We'll see. Hopefully, like, I, I hope that one doesn't burst. Um... Anyway, so yeah, and then here we obviously have the rest of the memory chips. The PCB is really, like, minimal. Like, there's not much on this PCB. Like, this area is completely empty. We've just got some, what I assume are linear voltage regulators over here. Um, and what's interesting about the power delivery on this is, like, this might look like a ton of V-Core, but it's not. So you've got four-phase V-Core. That's this part. Then you've got two-phase memory control. I can't remember if it's two-phase memory controller or if it's two-phase memory. Where's my multimeter? Let's go get my multimeter. So, the way we're going to figure out if it's two-phase memory controller or memory is uh, we're going to stab one of the inductors and then we're going to stab one of the caps by the memory chips because there's no real reason for the low voltage memory controller power to go to any of the memory chips. Like, it doesn't need to go to those. Um, so, actually, we're going to use the... Uh, and it doesn't matter which side of the inductor you stab because it's basically a piece of wire. Um, a fancy piece of wire with a hell of a lot of metal around it, but basically a piece of wire. So, with any luck... Okay, now that's ground. Okay, no, so that is connected. I could be pr probing some around. No, yeah, so, okay, so this is this is your two-phase memory over here. This is your two-phase memory controller and four-phase V-core, which is, like, interesting power distribution, right? Like, the memory controller basically has the same amount of VRM that the core has. Um, as for the MOSFETs, I am... I've actually, like, I've shot this video a couple times, but, like, it was several days ago, so I've actually forgot. So, these are, so, low side, you're looking at KO35, K035, K0353, there, I can read, damn it. Um, and high side, we're looking at K0355. Now, the 355 is, if I remember correctly, a 10 milliohm RDS on high side MOSFET, which is kind of high. But the low side MOSFETs are 5 milliohms, so the 353s are 5 milliohms, which is actually not bad for a low side MOSFET. Like, it's not amazing. Um, you know, like, 5 milliohm RDS on MOSFET is what you get on the low end motherboards that I complain about all the time. But, uh, like, the thing is, MOSFETs have progressed in their RDS on values. Like, you can get some really, really low RDS on MOSFETs we th these days that still have acceptable, like, switching performance to be used in a VRM. Whereas there's, like, low... S like, the, the thing is, you can get MOSFETs which switch um, so slowly that you couldn't use them in a VRM because, like, your PWM cycle is going to be... Like, your, your switching cycle is so fast that the MOSFET would never get a chance to turn on. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, like, that's kind of been the limit for how low your RDS on for the low side MOSFETs can be, because some MOSFETs just don't, like, you can't switch all of them super fast, like, you can't switch some of them fast enough to actually use them. Anyway, um, so yeah, and then for the voltage controllers, we've got a, oh man, who cares? Like, so, the voltage controllers, like, there's your four-phase V-core controller, and then there's these two for the memory and the, well, memory and memory controller. And those two minor uh, minor controllers, those actually have public data sheets. This one doesn't, which is kind of annoying. Um, but yeah. So, interesting card in my opinion. 
but um uh, old and not working hopefully like if it starts working i'm i'm gonna be like i i hope it starts working like if i could get it to work again that would be really cool um i don't even need to, need it to like start working properly it's just like like it's it's an interesting card with an interesting heat sink also um from reading the tech power-up reviews, it sounds like this card ships with a significantly lower stock voltage than a lot of the other 4890s back then. So this might have a lot of overclocking headroom if I get it working again. Well, we'll like, we'll see. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that's that's it for the video. So thanks to my friend for, for sending this thing over. Um, and thanks for watching, like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon, there's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch stuff. Um, and yeah, both of those help out immensely with running the channel, so if you'd check them out, that would be much appreciated. Um, and that's it for the video, so thanks for watching, and goodbye.